A reading from the Gospel of John. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not want to come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may clearly be seen that their deeds have been done in God. At the Dallas Museum of Art, in the pre-Columbian exhibit, uh, there is a little statue of a little ceramic dog from Mexico which is about 2,000 years old. And this little statue, what's peculiar about it is that the dog is wearing a mask of a human, which is as creepy as it sounds, but as one docent described the statue to me, they said, it's like a little advertisement about how dogs are humans' best friends. Now, the trustworthiness and the companionship of our canine friends is surprising because dogs have the same DNA as wolves, right? But a long time ago, before poets even plumbed the depths of the human hearts, before pharaohs ever commissioned great pyramids to touch the skies, dogs were walking side by side with humans. I met my dog on the night of the election in 2012. I went over there to, I went to my friends Joel and Sarah's house in Fifth Ward in Houston, where stray dogs were fairly common in their neighborhood, and they had found two little stray puppies, no more than four months or four weeks old, that were in the front yard. And they brought these dogs in, hoping that one of the puppies went to one neighbor, and one of them might, uh, I might choose to take home with me. Now, I've not been one for matchmaking in my life, uh, but when I held this little dog that they had named Ginger, I held this little puppy in my hand, and immediately I knew, this is my dog. But her name isn't Ginger, it's Eleanor Roosevelt. (laughs) My favorite first lady, and my roommate's fiance said, we can call her Ellie, and all of our hearts melted at this 10-pound ball of fur. But, as it turns out, training a puppy is rough work. And if you've ever done that, you realize how time-consuming and frustrating it can be. But fortunately, my pastor at the time had recommended a book to me called The Art of Raising a Puppy, written by the monks of Newskeet in upstate New York. Some monasteries make cheese, some brew beer, uh, and these monks, they train dogs for a living. And so they put out this little book that was incredibly helpful to me. And along with it, I learned that training a dog can be a spiritual exercise, teaching us about our own dependency and love for God. The monks, in fact, say what makes a good dog trainer is the same thing that makes a good monk, patience and perseverance. And without trust, There can be no relationship. In the same month that I found Ellie, I lost my grandmother. My grandma Lucille lived with my family for our whole life, and she taught me more about what it means to love God and love neighbor than anyone else. And as I grieved my grandmother, this little puppy who woke with me every morning and who met me at the door every night helped me through my journey of grief with, as I said goodbye to my grandmother. And this little creature curled up on the couch next to me and practiced 
the pastoral art of presence. Yeah, she's just a dog. But I learned something about God from this little puppy. Love doesn't really make sense. It doesn't make sense how a human can love a dog or a dog can love a human or how God can love humans or how we can even begin to love an ineffable mystery like the divine. But that's just how love works. There's a grace in love which we can try to rationalize or we can try to earn all day long. And the pendulum of our faith swings between receiving and earning because we assume that we have to do something to earn God's love, that we have to follow some set of rules, that we have to be our best self, but love is not the prize. Love is the starting line. It is the track. It is the cheering crowd around us as we run to earn that prize. Because God is love. We run not to earn God's love, but because we are already loved. We don't need more facts about how we are loved or by whom we are loved. We need a new narrative. We need a new story to teach ourselves, to put away childhood narratives of shame or abandonment or embarrassment so that we can hear a new, fresh story about how even when we fall, even when we fail, we are forever fully loved and lovely. We need good news. In our text today, we hear the most often quoted and memorized portion of the New Testament, John 3.16. And even now, if you ask me to recite John 3.16, you're going to get, not in RSV or NIV, you're going to get the King Jimmy version of John 3.16, because that begotten and that whosoever, I'm not going to give up on it. And they were drilled into my mind deep at Mission Friends as a baby Baptist. So. And so while this text is so familiar to so many of us around the globe, there's something positively perplexing which plagues the theological imagination of so many of us when we read a text like this. Where does our pendulum swing? Towards just receiving God's grace or towards earning God's grace? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Do we accept that we are loved or do we believe that we have to earn it? So to consider this question, let's look at the larger context of John 3.16. There was a man named Nicodemus who came to Jesus late one night. And in a day when before the power of electricity had been harnessed, the lines between night and day are pretty fuzzy for us. But before there were light bulbs and street lights, the lines were much clearer. And if you went out after dark, it meant that you had business to do or you didn't want to be seen. And Nicodemus didn't want either. He was a leader in the synagogue a reputable member of the religious community, a man to whom people listened, obeyed, and followed. And yet we see him creeping out after bedtime because on his way to see Jesus, he doesn't want to be seen, heard, or followed. No respectable member of the religious establishment would ever dare visit such a scandalous rabbi like this. Yet he knows that there is something different about this Jesus of Nazareth. We don't really know a lot about Nicodemus, but he shows up in three different episodes in John's gospel. In the first episode, we see him here puzzling over Jesus' teaching by twilight. The second time in chapter 7, we see Nicodemus meeting with the, with the Sanhedrin, the, assemb the assembly of religious leaders in the community. 
And he's calming down the crowd demanding for Jesus' blood by reminding them of the rights and due process afforded to Jesus and to the accused by Jewish law. And finally, in chapter 19, after the the crucifixion and death of Jesus, we see Nicodemus arrive and offer 100 pounds of myrrh and aloes, funeral spices, for embalming the body of Jesus. The politically careful Nicodemus, who once met with Jesus at night because he was afraid of being seen, at the end of John's gospel, is footing the mortician's bill. That's quite a narrative arc. I can't imagine, though, how odd Jesus' teaching must have sounded to Nicodemus on that first night. For a man whose religious practice was probably defined by obedience and observance, to be told that love and belief, not ritualism and rule following, are all that is asked of God's children. There is a place for rituals and rules, of course. Rituals ground us in a rapidly changing world. Rules help us to respect the boundary of healthy social interactions. But they will not save us. Only love will save us. The kind of love which leads one to lay down their life for their friends. The kind of love that leads Jesus not to fight against the cross, but to embrace it. That is a love that will not let us go. In this season of Lent, we focus on the not quiteness of our faith. We're not quite done. We're still in this journey of life. We're still moving together. And we use this term practice a lot. We practice our faith. And as we practice our faith, we experience the pain of growth, and we also experience the pain of failure. In our Linton book study group a couple of weeks ago, I was leading the discussion on the, the book, 40 Days with the Holy Spirit, that, some, that many of us are reading through our Lenten journey. And what I heard in the class was something that I hear in myself a lot. Well, I wish that I had read more. I wish that I should have spent more time in prayer. I should have done this. I should have done that. I should have, should have, should have. And we should have our faith to death knowing that we are called to practice our faith. God perfects our faith. And it is the doubt that we experience in the wilderness of Lent that shapes, that molds us so often. A Methodist clergy friend of mine and mentor once said to me, doubt is not the opposite of faith. Faith is the opposite of of certainty. We are not promised reasons or certainty. We are promised love and hope, served in portions of daily bread, not enough to hoard, just enough for today. So before we can even begin to grasp an infinite mystery like Jesus shares in John 3.16, we might consider what we mean by a word like belief a word so thick and rich. And in his seminal work, The Nature of Doctrine, the great Yale theologian George Lindbeck attempts to define and understand what we mean by our statements of belief. And in his first description, he explains how many religious communities understand belief as first and foremost an agreement with a certain set of principles and statements like a witness in court raising her hand and repeating after the bailiff, I believe in God the Father, Almighty Maker of heaven and Maker of earth. And we understand belief this way, that there's a checklist of doctrinal statements. And if I'm a good Christian, I can check off the whole list. But where's the room to wrestle? Where is the space to seek and search and ask questions and doubt if faith is nothing more 
than five initials and a signature at the bottom of our belief contract. I think that faith has more to do with courage and trust than it does with intellectual assent or agreement. To have faith in Christ is the courage to get out of bed in the morning, to love your neighbor and to trust that God loves you both. Faith is about believing that you were loved even when the world tells you you aren't enough. Try harder, do more, be better. And this is the great pendulum swing throughout the history of humanity. I'm not enough. You are loved. And we could think about the history of religion and Christianity specifically with these pendulum swings between receiving and earning law and grace. The great liberation theologian and philosopher from Mexico, Jose Miranda, once wrote, from the time Christ demonstrated what a person can be, our dissatisfaction with what we are has become torturous. Unlike the pet who trusts that there will be enough food in the bowl and walks to be had, we look at God and we say, but there's got to be more, right? There's got to be something else I can do to fix the shame inside of me. And through the history of the church, we have done a terrible job of communicating this simple truth. And we have fallen victims to the, these pendulum swings ourselves. Whenever the church has cared more about power and position, we have failed. Wherever the church has feared the future and dug in its heels, we have failed. Wherever the church has preached anything other than the wideness of God's love and mercy and practiced anything short of justice and compassion for all, we have failed. But thanks be to God, God so loved the world that God has not given up on us yet. Ernest Hemingway tells the story of a young son and his father driven apart by the son's shameful actions. And the father comes to a place of grace and seeks to forgive and be reconciled with his son, and he searches Spain and he cannot find him. So eventually he takes, a pay, he takes an advertisement out in the newspaper in Madrid. And he writes, Paco, meet me at Hotel Montaña at noon. All is forgiven. Papa. And the next day at noon, the owner of the Hotel Montaña called the local police to keep the peace at, because there were, five, uh, there were 800 weeping young men wandering around the city square, wandering around the hotel, all named Paco, looking for their fathers. We crave love. We crave reconciliation. We crave forgiveness. And Jesus tells Nicodemus he was sent not to condemn us, but to save us, to show us a path to life, and yet we continue to build walls between ourselves and others. We continue to listen to those old shame narratives and those childhood messages telling us that we just aren't good enough. But the good news is that we aren't. It is not asked of us to be better than we are or to be good enough. We are invited to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. We are called to be our truest selves. The rabbis say, when I go and I am judged before God, I will not be asked, why were you not more like Moses? Why were you not more like Elijah? I will be asked, why? Was I not more like me? So where does this pendulum swing swing for us? For God so loved the world or whoever 
believes will not perish but have eternal life. I think we should take the statement as it is stated. The truth, the love, the love is real and true and it is here now. And whether or not we want to join God by loving our neighbor, that is the invitation. We are loved and we are invited out of that love to love others and extend the hand of grace. Amen.